Whoa, you seeing this? If you're using a heat lamp, then you had better watch this video to see what I just learned. Because you might be putting yourself and your property at risk if you don't understand what you're playing with here. Hey, I'm Tori. Welcome to the Omega Ready channel. No smart ass intro today. We're just getting right down to business because this is nothing to laugh about. Let's go take a look. In nature, a hen keeps her chicks warm and safe by allowing them to gather under her wings and body. If you're not using a hen to raise your chicks, then you need a way to provide that heat. A heat lamp is one method used to raise chicks until they reach the feathering stage and can handle ambient temperatures without the need for supplemental heat. The heat lamp is a simple device that turns electricity into light and heat. The heat lamp assembly consists of a few separate parts. It has an electrical system, which includes the socket and wiring. This is attached to a metal diffuser housing, which helps protect the bulb and concentrate the heat. It also usually comes with some mounting hardware like a metal hanger and a clamp to help affix the heat lamp assembly to a rigid item for correct placement. The last item that every heat lamp assembly comes with is some kind of a guard that fits onto the housing either by direct couple or by spring tension. Somewhere on the diffuser housing you will find a sticker that identifies the operational specifications of the heat lamp. It will tell you what the maximum bulb wattage that the lamp is rated for by no means should you exceed this rating ever. The heat lamp that I use comes with this snap-on guard. It's about four inches tall and attaches to the base by spring tension from the guard arms. It's of interest to note that the bulb I'm using, which is a standard size, actually protrudes from the housing of the lamp by about a quarter of an inch. That means that the bulb, if allowed to, can come into direct contact with the surface it's heating. So, I thought it would be interesting to perform a simple test to show you the temperature you might experience if your heat lamp falls off of its mount and onto the bedding of your brooder or your coop. We will run two versions of this test, one with the guard in place and one without the guard in place. This way you can see firsthand if the guard does what it's supposed to do. So let's take a look at what we will use to run this test. A metal stock tank to represent a brooder and to keep things contained. A 300 watt rated heat lamp assembly with a 250 watt red tinted bulb. A K-type thermocouple and a thermocouple data logger. This device will measure the temperature that the heat lamp puts out. I'll install it on the floor of the stock tank directly under the heat lamp bulb. An infrared thermometer to measure surface temperature of the lamp. The heat lamp is resting on a pair of fire bricks that prevent it from touching the ground. The bricks place the bulb about an inch and a quarter up off the floor of the stock tank. This means that I have an air gap of about one inch from the thermocouple probe to the bulb face, given that the bulb protrudes approximately a quarter inch out of the diffuser. And an electricity usage monitor. This device measures the voltage and amperage that your circuit consumes and can then calculate wattage or electrical power. We will use this to ensure that the device is putting out the claimed power for the bulb. So we will plug in the heat lamp, record the wattage and temperature until we see the maximum temperature value. And at that point, that's the end of the test. With the guard in place, the maximum temperature reached is 219 degrees Fahrenheit near the center of the diffuser. It took about 16 minutes to hit that temperature. During the test, the electrical power meter read between 245 and 246 watts, so pretty close to the 250 rating. Without the guard in place, the max temperature measured is 439 degrees near the center of the diffuser. Keep in mind, though, that there is a slight air gap between the bulb and the ther thermocouple. It took about 11 minutes to hit that temperature. During this test, the electrical power meter read between 244 and 248 watts. So again, pretty close to the rated 250. Also, I checked the surface temperature of the diffuser uh, to verify how hot that it gets. And it looks like the hottest area hits around 200 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, according to the infrared thermometer. 
So now that we know the temperatures, what does that tell us? Well, it obviously tells us that things get wicked hot. Even with the garden place, we see 219 degrees directly underneath the heat lamp with an air gap of about four inches. I don't care where you're from, that's pretty hot. Hot enough to start a fire? Not necessarily. For that to happen, it looks like you would need direct contact with the bulb touching or very close to the bedding material. Remember, we hit 439 degrees with about a one inch air gap, so things will be even hotter if the bulb directly touches another surface. So wait a damn second here. Who am I to be making these bold predictions about fire? Well, given my shady past, you'd be wise to question me. But luckily, it's not up to me. It's up to science. Because I represent science. Oh, oh no, 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 not this again. Not that science, this science. The term auto ignition point is used to define the temperature at which a material will begin to combust. The auto ignition point is usually given as a temperature range because environmental details like pressure and humidity can impact the auto ignition temperature of a material. So to draw this test full circle, we should be asking what is the auto ignition point of common bedding material? The auto ignition point of pine shavings is given as a range of 400 to 500 degrees F according to numerous MSDS sheets I found online. Paper is around 440 to 500 degrees and shredded cardboard 440 to 470 degrees. So as you can see, if we're hitting 439 degrees with a one inch air gap and these common bedding materials auto ignite in the 400 to 450 degree temperature range, then you can see where there might be a problem. All right, so let's take this test to its logical conclusion. We're gonna place these, this heat lamp with the guard on into the brooder and verify what happens to the bedding material. And then we're gonna repeat the test with the heat guard off and the lamp a little bit lower. So we go from four inches down to, I, I guess, just about touching less than an inch of space to see what happens in that case to the bedding. Okay, so what you're watching here is time lapsed over about 20 minutes. And as you can see, the heat lamp with the guard on resulted in nothing. The guard works, it does what it's supposed to. By keeping that four inch air gap, it keeps a boundary between the bulb and the bedding that does not get hot enough to combust this pine shaving bedding material, regardless of how long it sits there. Turns out science was right. Based on our initial test, the max temperature seen below the guard with the thermocouple was around 219 degrees, which is well below the auto ignition temperature. So I guess we shouldn't be surprised that nothing happened. Thanks, science. Now let's take a look at what happened with the heat lamp guard removed. What you're watching here is time lapsed over 13 minutes. First thing to notice is that we start to see smoke appearing at about the one minute, 12 second mark. This is obviously a troubling sign and suggests that things are getting close to the auto ignition temperature. Then as the smoke level starts to increase, we see our first flame appear after three minutes, 10 seconds, and things only get worse from there. So I guess we shouldn't be too surprised at this result since we know what the auto ignition temperature is and we know what the bulbs output definitely gets us into that range. One thing that did surprise me though, is the time it took to get to the auto ignition temperature. It took less than four minutes for things to get crazy. That is scary fast and should be a wake up call to anyone using a heat lamp. So after conducting this test and changing my underwear, I've come up with some pretty reasonable conclusions. Heat lamps that fall onto bedding material in which a guard is used, get hot, but not necessarily hot enough to combust common bedding material. Heat lamps that fall into bedding material in which a guard is not used, get hot enough to combust common bedding material. All of that is certainly interesting to know, but we're not quite done yet. We've got a variable in this equation that can't be ignored. That variable is the chicken, or more specifically, the chick. In making videos for our introduction to raising chicken series, I collected a lot of video footage that was taken with me out of the brooder. This means that the chicks were doing what they do when I'm not around, but in front of the camera. Frankly speaking, I was utterly surprised to see the level of anarchy 
that takes place when I'm not around. The video footage showed numerous examples of chicks coming into contact with the heat lamp. Some contact was minor, like them pecking at the diffuser, and other contact was rather significant, enough to physically move or rock the heat lamp assembly. Having raised chicks for about 10 years now, I can honestly tell you that I never witnessed this in person, only on video. Chicks apparently act differently when we're not around. These cute little puffs of feathers are borderline anarchists when left to their own devices. All right, so after reviewing the results of this testing and becoming fully aware of what chicks do when I'm not around, I've had a come to Jesus moment because of the scary realization that I have gotten by over the years on some degree of luck. And luck is no way to get by. So my final conclusion is that I need to take some additional measures to reduce the risk of something ugly happening in my barn. So I did some research and have decided that if I choose to use a heat lamp in the future, that I will incorporate some changes to ensure that I reduce my risk. So here are my ideas. Number one, always use the heat lamp guard. Always. That four inch air gap is critical in keeping temperatures below the auto ignition range of common bedding materials. Number two, use the metal wire hanging loop to support the heat lamp and ditch the spring clamp assembly. These spring clamps strike me as too chintzy to live up to the wild antics taking place in a brooder when chicks are involved. Also, don't increase risk by using rope or twine or fishing line to hang your heat lamp. Use metal wire. It isn't going to burn or cut like softer materials will. Number three, build a strong support system for the heat lamp using wood or metal and add redundant safety by using the heat lamp cord to loosely wrap around the structure. Number four, use a shatter resistant heat bulb. These bulbs are made from ceramic and only have a heating element and it doesn't make any light, which is fine. Five last item, use sand as a bedding material. It's a cheap alternative, it's easy to come by, and most importantly, it doesn't combust. Add all of these things together and you will be making a big dent in the risk of using a heat lamp. Please apply what you've learned here today. Don't take any chances and drive your risk down. Okay, so there you have it. Some ideas of what you can do to reduce the risk of having to use a heat lamp inside of your brooder or your coop. And there's plenty of risk associated with it. So be smart about it. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you learned something. We'll catch you next time.